Well, yesterday we had about 10 of us on here and uh, I did the, tried to do the record thing, but at the end, I made a presidential error. And this, this president here especially confesses to errors. I'm not quite like some of them in the South. I am a president and I have a first lady and I live in a White House. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'm, it's, it's a cousin, Abe Lincoln was a cousin of mine back, uh, what, those years, a uh, hundred and some years ago. And uh, it, it, we ended up to, my relatives escaped to Canada, thank goodness. It was something that's good <laughs> to get out of that that business down there. Now, Gord's as closer to the U.S. as you're going to get, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From yeah, we're glad to close the borders because uh, the, the Americans uh, have a real problem, especially in Minnesota, with the, the COVID bug. Like, even with us, uh, I just got a, a Twitter message that uh, as of tomorrow, they're putting us in the red zone. Oh. Like we, we've been fine up to now. So well, I think uh, I think all the variants are spreading now all, all across because yeah. I think they uh, had it on the news that Dryden had it and I think you guys had it Rainy River. Um, and mm. now they've just had it in the newspaper today that there's several, well, the UK one I think is in Thunder Bay. And like right now, Thunder Bay is, it's terrible. The numbers are just, awful yeah so we, were doing, we were doing well and then i don't know like all hell broke loose and it's just been crazy so pretty scary times that's for sure yeah the uh <clears throat> here they have a like a it's a private residence but the it's not far from uh, uh sir sanford fleming or fleming college and where a lot of the students stay and a few well about a month ago now uh, about a dozen or more of them decided to have a party and they said actually the numbers were higher than that and that started the spread from that group almost wow. immediately became 40 some cases in the city which put us back into red real quick but now wow. they now one of those young people has been rushed to the hospital in toronto from peterborough and he or she is in pretty serious condition wow. so it's it's one of those sad things and this variant is the thing that's causing it you now and we see in the news now that Toronto now, the, the big hospitals are setting up the, the uh, temporary tent kind of things out in the parking lots. Right. So now they're ready for the third wave, which they feel is probably going to happen in Toronto because of the uh, issue, what this variant is doing. Yeah, yeah, right. But some of us have been talking and we think that the variant actually was here or something of that sort was here uh, even before the March shutdown last year. And I was at a, a wood show in Toronto and it was a big one. It was about three days long. We were there for about four days and there was probably about 25,000 people that come to the show in four days, three days there. And it was following that within the next few weeks, I started getting sick. And wow. eventually I've got the early stages of the COPD coming on too. So lungs are going to be an issue. And I ended up in the hospital with IV and really sick. I couldn't breathe. It was really tough stuff. And so when they did the tests, et cetera, they said, uh, I said, well, what was it? What is it? He said, well, the uh, doctor that was dealing with me, he said, well, it's some sort of an influenza. We don't know. Wow. And so I was just talking to another person uh, from our area here also that was in September of uh, 2019 he had almost exactly the same kind of bug. Yeah. So the, this variant thing that's supposedly coming from the COVID, uh, the variants come all the time from all these different uh, influenzas. Right. Either A to B and then some we don't know. And so some of us have probably been affected and we didn't even know about it. Right, exactly. And that's the problem is that a lot of people don't even realize they bought it and then they go out and spread it and, and that's, how it all you know it yeah. all happens but yeah these crazy young people don't think they're invincible and they're not going to get it but that's pretty sad you know i think it's affecting anybody right now it doesn't matter what age you are you know as much as this is a, a serious situation you're facing whether it's thunder bay or any one of our places here uh it's affected our carving community in a mm -hmm. big way Oh, absolutely. And to my knowledge, at this point, I don't think any of our many or any of our folks 
that were actually in the clubs have been affected. I haven't heard any reports back of people being hospitalized or that type of thing. It may be that is the case because we have quite a large number of carvers all across the province. But uh, when I started talking to get messages back from club presidents and club members, uh, it's not a good situation because the ones that are in the older category, and, you know, some are in the 80s and up in 90s, the club had been a great connector for them. Uh, many of those men come and women come just to sit and talk and have coffee. They rub a little bit of sandpaper on the side of the carving they're doing. And I was back to visit one club about a year ago and I, or two years ago. And I came back again and the carving hadn't changed shape. It had been a little smoother, but he had a great time. And so they're all talking over the, at the edge of the uh, the meeting. And so that kind of thing is happening often. So our clubs have become, uh, you know, some, some of these members have been 25 years or more uh, in that particular group of guys and gals where they, where they carve with. Now this has interrupted it. And then you add to the other factor is that the kids are on top of those uh, moms and dads that have been once carving with us and said, dad, you don't need to go out. I'll get your groceries. I'm, I, I want you to stay home. We don't want you getting sick. So he stays at home or she stays or they stay at home and don't go anywhere. Well, that has caused a, a new kind of pressure and mental uh, problems with these folks an isolation that's just is hard to imagine. And these people are in the community, not just in the seniors homes. But as we see that happening, some have just given up. He said, I, I don't want to carve anymore. I just lost my one fellow says I lost my mojo. Another fellow has been on uh, online with us here in these different sessions during the week. He said uh, this business of getting together on Zoom has been a real help. He says, I'm getting my mojo back again. And so this is really one of the reasons we do this to get together is to hopefully motivate some mojo. So what about in your area? I know, Gordon, you're all carving by yourself pretty well, but uh, the other two here that are here, uh, Alec and Pat, What's happening in your clubs or your area? Uh, uh, well, we're doing the same thing. We, we initiated the Zoom uh, meetings and they are going very well. Uh, again, because of the demographics, age demographics in, in any carving group, it's uh, elderly people that aren't comfortable with technology. And so it's caused a, you know, a, a little bit of uh, anxiety on their part, I guess, to join. But we've got a really good treasurer, Wayne, and he's very proficient in it. So he gets on board, gets them on the phone, gets them to install it, and then walks them through it. So I think um, our membership is usually at around 65. When we were meeting in person, we would get probably about maybe 40 people out at the church. And um, <clears throat> when we first started going on Zoom, we started out with maybe 12. And then, and then it kind of doubled. Well, the last meeting that we had we had like 44 people on on zoom chat which was great you know so more and more people are getting comfortable with it we're trying to offer a really nice variety of things we start out with a show and tell where everybody can show what they've been carving um you know whether it's been last week or whether it was last year it's just something to to bring your carvings back out um we do a q a uh at the end and uh Lately, we initiated what's called a studio tour. So we're encouraging some of our members to do a little video presentation of where they carve and, and so on. So we've had a couple of very good ones in that. And, and that kind of makes it interesting. But you're absolutely right. Um, it's the same with anything. It's so much more fun and more productive when you get together as a group because you can feed off each other. You get ideas. You get help. It's no fun to do this at home by yourself, you know. I mean, a lot of our carvers are, you know, pretty dedicated and they still are carving, but I don't think to the extent that it was happening beforehand when we would all get together. Because when we had our meetings, we would always have like a, a feature carving or a feature project to work on. And uh, so that kind of got everybody carving at the meeting. And then we had open carves on Wednesday afternoons for those people that wanted to do more work. And so they could all get together there and, and continue on the project and whatever. So, you know, we try to have like a new project at least every couple months. 
and uh, that's that's what we're finding right now is that we can't really we don't have anybody that can do like a like a zoom you know photographing what you're doing kind of thing I mean you can kind of do it when you're sitting here and I can show you okay this is what I'm doing but we need something like a YouTube video almost that would you know give us some uh, give us some information and that people could carve along with. Uh, one of our members the other day uh, suggested that we do a, a coffee and carve. So again, by Zoom, you know, however many people want to get on board and it would just be very informal, but they would kind of all carve together and just chat. So yeah, I, I you know, we're trying and uh, it seems to be, uh, seems to be, you know, helping obviously with the Zoom because it's just keeping people connected. We send out a newsletter every month um, just before our meeting with, uh, you know, little bits of information and so on. So I've sent out these links. I sent, I'm constantly sending emails to our members, you know, with the links and things on that you've been giving us. So it's been great. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, hopefully we can hang in there so we can open up again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks for the floor. <laughs> great. No, Alec is a little different than us in that he, uh, I think among the, the four of us on the screen right now, He's one of those guys that runs away south almost all the cold weather and then comes back north. Uh -huh. But COVID has absolutely stopped him from doing all that silly stuff. What's it like for you, Alec? Oh, he's got to turn his mic on. Oh, turn your mic on. Oh. There we go. Yeah. There you go. This is the first time in 20 years that I haven't been away during the winter, but uh, I think I survive quite nicely. Like uh, I play guitar, so I either play guitar. I don't play with my, my regular groups anymore because of the COVID. Same as the uh, wood carving. I'm a member of two carvings, a Guelph carving club and the Pine Meadows carving club. What's the last and, name? Pardon? What's the last name? Pine Meadows. Pine Rose? A road. Pine Meadows. Meadows, okay. Yeah. Where are we they got, located? Uh, near Bellwood. Okay. And uh, I actually teach courses out there and I have a pretty good time. Um, you were talking about the some gentleman uh, sanding his carving and drinking coffee and talking. We had one gentleman, Paul, He uh, it took him two years to have everybody else carve a panda bear for him. <laughs> but he got it done. Everybody did a little bit here, a little bit there, and finally he got it so it was ready for paint, and he even tried to get somebody to paint it for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I, I have a good time carving. I quite enjoy it. One of our uh, carvers from the Guelph Club, uh, Dudley Lewis, he's, uh, he's um, upper 80s. He just moved into a retirement home, but uh, when Blanche, his wife Blanche was alive, he used to sit in the living room on the couch and he's known well for his Fordhams. And he would just sit there and grind and grind. And he'd just be a big mass of dust. And uh, they didn't have any ventilation or anything. It just, everything was covered in dust. Wow. Yeah. One other thing, Pat, I used to go to Thunder Bay quite a bit. Okay. Uh, my brother-in-law was in charge of the air ambulance service for uh, Ontario there. Oh, my daughter's a paramedic. Is she, Will? Um, and she worked on the air ambulance. Very good. His name is Bill Graham. Oh, I'll have to write that down. Yeah, write that down. Uh, anyway, Bill moved down here. I retired seven years ago, so I haven't been up there since I retired, but he's moved down to London. Mm -hmm. so he's in London now, so it, it doesn't just... Takes less time to travel yeah. time to get to see him. But wh while I was in Thunder Bay, each time I would go up, I would search and search to see if there was a carving club. So really? I would I would check and see how your uh, your online uh, stuff is. It may be better than it was seven years ago, but uh, I think eight years ago was the last time I was up there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Because we've been in existence for 20, probably 25 years now. Yeah. yeah. So we're on Facebook. We don't have a like a website, but we are on Facebook. But oh, that see, probably yeah. only happened a little while ago. So I'm not a Facebook guy. Oh, there you go. So, but yeah. yeah I'm very uh, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's curious um you know how other people uh, advertise their groups i guess i mean i don't know how you would find find out something like that just well generally you just punch it in the google and say right uh, thunder bay carving club and I'll, share, it comes. I'll share yeah. two things on that uh that I found now as I've been investigating this very thought, this very idea, is uh, the, first off, the Facebook thing is only about 12 years old for most of us. Mm -hmm. And so it would be 12 years or so where that's when most of my age group uh, started to join in because your kids were getting on. And one of my, uh, one of our, a couple friends of ours, uh, another couple that are friends of ours, she, she said, I had to get on Facebook because my kids are on and that's the only way I could see my grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're strung out all over the province, different places in Canada too. And so when we look at that, uh, what I found is I, when I started doing the editing and being become the editor of the magazine, I really was fairly new to the organization. So what I tried to do was to go I travel to uh, different club meetings in the region. So coming out from Peterborough, I could go to Toronto, I could go up north, I could go south, and different places around and to see their club meetings. And what I found was almost identical in every group. They enjoy getting together on that day or that time. Their carving's done in that place. But when you talk to them about the fact you go out of your, your, you, do you have shows once a year? No, no, we don't do that. We just, we come to our carving club. I said, I told them about uh, Gord Seberger and myself being in the Peterborough Mall and every week going down Wednesday and setting up uh, two or three tables full of carvings. And they look at you like you've got three heads. You do that? I was at carving shows when I first started going to the carving shows and setting up two big, uh, six or eight foot tables we'd be between 16 to 18 six to 12 16 to 12 feet long of carvings covering almost the top of the table and the club guys are coming along and they've got four carvings and a nice red tablecloth and they come over very carefully and said wow you sure got a lot of stuff i said yeah they said do you bring that to all the shows i said yes in fact i do that every wednesday in peterborough you do? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's with you? And so I tell them that that's the opportunity to get out to tell people about carving. And in fact, I don't belong to the Peterborough Club of Carvers, and they're in a seniors uh, complex or senior building up to the north part of our city. It's a build, like an old school that was built in 1860, and the seniors have got to hold it, refurbished it with government money. And the carvers have a full workshop in that place that they carve in. It's in the backside of the classroom. They've uh, of a classroom in the building. It's got a division in it. It's got full um, ventilation, air exchangers, dust collectors. I think they have two or three band saws in there. They got lathes. They have table saws. They have every bit of tools you can imagine. But they're in that place, and they don't go anywhere. Hmm. What we found, Gordon and I both found, is that there's people that want to learn how to carve, but as they start to, to jump into the carving, they want to start simple and start little, yeah. and they have absolutely no confidence at all, and so they don't want to even show you what they did last week because it's such a mess, <laughs> and that's with me and with Gord, and so when we're, when we're having these fellows, you kind of encourage them and get them to go a little bit more and... <clears throat> Then when they get to a certain stage, I said, you might be interested in joining the Peterborough carving group up at the, at the school. Wow, I didn't, I don't know about that place. Where, what is it? Well, it's on the website. Well, I don't do web. I don't, I don't <laughs> do that kind of thing. And so you finally get them connected and there have been one or two that have gone up. But then the issue is when they come into the club, in the club itself, as they sit at the tables, they have their chair. They have their place. In fact, they've got their patterns on that table and it's claimed. How in the world does another person fit in? I took carvings up there one time to, and I know the, the person very well, the chair person is one of my neighbors here. And I went up to the group and I, I came with my little kit, to my, you know, kind of a portable thing. I was carrying some carvings in the little things and some knives on that. 
and I, I didn't know where to sit. But you see, one of the things that's the comedy for me personally is that I am a former minister. I retired 13 years ago after uh, a working career in church. And guess what they have in church? They have favorite pews. And good Lord help us, if you sit on the wrong pew when you come in, you will be looked at. <laughs> and carving groups are the same way. They've got their little clusters of people that know each other real well. Or they know each other's jokes so well that they'll keep laughing at the same jokes over and over and over and over again. When somebody comes into it, how do they break through that barrier? And so what often happens is that you'll find clusters of three or four people then getting together themselves and starting to carve together. And they don't connect with that carving club. If that happens, the carving club ages. Eventually, the president's sick and tired of doing the same job over and over and over and over again. And they quit. And nobody wants the job. And so basically, the club gets a little fuzzy, still keeps coming. But you add one factor to that, have the place that they're meeting in raise the rent. And boom, you got a problem. And we've seen a couple of the carving groups dissolve because they could not, the carvers were not growing in numbers and they didn't have the cash in order to pay the places, they pay the, the uh, rental or the you know, facility for that space. So as I say that kind of thing and look at what happens our carving groups somehow have to get out of where they are and have a show. Now, the neat thing happens with uh, uh, over in the, the Toronto area, I think it's probably Scarborough area where these guys meet. One of them is coming on just now. But uh, these three older men take uh, go to a park. One guy gets there a little early and gets the uh, um, table and sets up his stuff on it and the other guys join him at the picnic table and they carve and talk to people. And if uh, Forrest, if you can hear me, Forrest Gerson, are you there? Can you hear? And put yes, your, I can hear you. Put your video on too so we can see what you look like. I'm just talking about you. Oh, what do I do with that? <laughs> I, I hopefully got the story up before you started listening. There's a, on the, the Zoom screen, there's a small camera looking, it says start or stop video. Start video, touch that once and your camera will come on. Anyway, they go to the park and they reach out to people and it, it, it gives, uh, first off, it, it helps you personally when you're talking to people like that to get kind of a personal pride about your carving. And you personally will like showing your carving. There's no competition to it. It's just people that come by. My wife and I go down to a park. If you've ever been to Peterborough, it's got a, we have the lift walks here, this great big high thing that raises boats up from one level to the next where they can go up the uh, canal. Can you see me now? Not yet. The little camera, do you see that camera? There's a microphone on the left-hand side and a camera icon. Bottom of the screen beside your mute. There you are. There you go. Oh. Hello, hello. I didn't check my background. <laughs> Carving in the park. No, Forrest, so I was talking about, weren't you involved with some of the fellows that uh, meet in the park and carve in the park in Toronto and Scarborough? Yeah, we started that a couple of years ago. And at the beginning, uh, it was just two of us. <clears throat> uh, we would go to different parks uh, along Lake Ontario just to see what things were like. And as more people joined our group, we ended up at uh, Bluffers Park at the foot of Brimley Avenue in Scarborough. And what we would do is uh, establish Thursday as our meeting day. And the basic rule was that the first one that got there would got to and reserve it for us. And then we would just filter in and uh, very casually start carving and talking to each other about all kinds of different things. People would walk by and come over to see uh, what we were doing and we would end up chatting with them 
and a lot of interesting stories started to turn out. Purely a casual occasion. Uh, carving wasn't of major importance, being social was. So when you're doing this kind That's of thing, essentially what it was. Uh, do you have people interested in getting some of your carvings, perhaps, or do you give them away? Well, mine I didn't give away because I was doing the larger carvings, and uh, another carver with us. His name was Fraser. Um, he would offer them up for sale. Occasionally, we would give a, a carving away, depending on how uh, anxious the child was willing to give it back. <laughs> 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 and, and Bill Mayette, who was with us, uh, he generally sold his spoons. And he did a pretty good business selling spoons, especially spoons of the Seven Dwarfs and of uh, uh, <clears throat> a baseball team, the local baseball team. Mm -hmm. They had carvings out of spoons for them. But the oh. others, uh, we would be carving uh, uh, things in the round or relief carvings. And we would have discussions about those and those are carvings that would take us maybe weeks, sometimes months and months to do. Mm -hmm. When we had the uh, word last uh, spring and summer, when we're using the word bubble, and you'd have up to so many people in your bubble to get together, uh, we did some in the park, similar to what you did, Forrest. And then uh, when some people felt that that wasn't something they could do, the weather was getting a little, it was changing some, I brought them to my driveway. And my driveway has, you could probably park about eight cars in it. It's a nightmare when the snow comes. A snowblower helps, but it's a lot of snow to move. But these uh, mm -hmm. folks come under the great big shade of the tree, and, and we stayed six feet apart. It, it was just great talking to one another and getting together. That was after about six months. And it, it was nowhere near the 12 months now or the, you know, how long we're going to be. But I think that uh, I want to emphasize the fact of getting out from where you are is so important to let the public know where you are. We assume that a great web page is going to do all of the work for us, but nothing is more attractive than somebody's hands whittling on something. Now I'm going to go to Gord <clears throat> from over at Fort Francis. Uh, you've got some unique things. I've reported on some of it in the magazine. You've told us a little bit about it, but uh, the farmer's market came open to you not far away from where you live, right? Yeah, uh, just about uh, three block, block, three block from my house. And Gord's in a wheelchair too, so he whips down with these electric wheelchairs and runs over anybody who gets in the way. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about what happened with this. At your uh, farmer's market. Well, it worked out pretty good because. Uh, there's like a local um, cultural committee and what, what they do is they provide a free canopy, uh, a free table, you just provide your own chair. And I come with my own chair. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they give you an A six foot table and uh, you know, it keeps you out of the sun. And there's, there's usually anywhere from half a dozen to 12 merchants locally. Um, yeah, it's they call it the farmers market, but there's only like one farmer that ever shows up. Um, but uh, it gave me an opportunity uh, with masks on uh, to meet uh, all the local people, and it's right, right in the middle of town. They they actually tore down a couple old buildings a few years ago, and they renovated a section with some modern art and stuff like that. And they got electricity there and. Um, all the amenities that you need, um, even a washroom for us guys that uh, need to go quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it, it uh, because it's right in the heart of town, uh, it gives gives an opportunity for a lot of walk through traffic, and uh, you know people on bicycles and 
uh, you can get access from about four different directions because of the way they, they built it. With an, uh, there's the old back street, and the main drag, and uh, there's a restaurant. Like I said, it's right on the main drag of town. So uh, it's not that long of a main drag, but <laughs> uh, you know, five, five minute walk in here from one end of town to the other. Um, but uh, it gives everybody an opportunity. And during lunchtime, uh, a lot of the local merchants uh, come by. And uh, it, it gave me really good exposure. And uh, it just so happens as uh, the local art gallery, they, they moved from a side street to the main street as well. And uh, I got myself set up with a table there. How did you get so, involved with that one, Gord? Sorry? How did you get involved with that local art gallery? Well, it, it's just, um, I, I heard they moved to a better location, first of all. And uh, so I just went in there to check them out. And, started chatting with the ladies and uh, basically for uh, 85 bucks a month, they man the store all day for you. They help you with the setup of decorations. They provide a table and you just provide the nice tablecloth. Uh, they give you a hunk of wall to hang up stuff if you got wall hanging. So they parked me with my table right up against the wall. So I got both the wall and the table for uh, all my different carvings. So I, I got it with maybe about 80 different carvings hanging and everything from Harry Potter ones, magic spo uh, wood spoons and uh, my head, my tiki heads, like, and all my cartoon characters. As you, you remember, I had quite a variety of uh, things I'd make, <laughs> trying to make people, you would, uh, I was listening to your video the other day from uh, the Comfort Birds. And uh, that's a real big thing around here where uh, I've been donating a lot of time uh, to the local little aid center, uh, teaching them soap carving and um, uh, um, uh, donating a lot of comfort birds and I can make comfort crosses for them. And uh, they, they use them uh, like for Christmas time and for different events and stuff. So, and I don't donate some of my tiki heads and that to like the, the Boy Scouts, the uh, Air Cadets and things like that. Uh, the, I start getting pictures in the local paper with little write-ups, uh, uh, was it three times now in the main, they get like half page article <laughs> in the local paper. So, and oh. I, I try to put a plug in for the Woodcarvers Association too. <laughs> now, Gord, just as you moved to uh, uh, Fort Francis, I think you did some investigation to see if there's any other carvers around. What did you find? Uh, well, there was a club. Um, they were down to maybe, I think, about half a dozen people. Uh, and I managed to, the only reason I found out about him, because the, the fellow that used to be the president uh, gave like a little... Uh, Bark carving uh, thing at the local art uh, um, uh, library, um, and there was a little write up on him, uh, a little tiny article in the paper. So, and I, so I was able to get his phone number and gave him a call and went to visit him. And they they pretty well dissolved themselves because uh, there's not enough of them. And I guess with this COVID thing, it doesn't help either. Uh, but. Uh, he he's, he still does carving. He's got his workshop. Uh, he's he's. I thought I was in the middle of nowhere. He's he's on a road. You keep on driving, and then it ends, and there he is. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of absolute nowhere. Um, but he's well, getting Francis. Uh, that's quite a statement. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm in a big city compared to him. Uh, so, but. Uh, Anyway, I was chatting with them, telling them about the club and uh, or the uh, not the club, but the uh, woodcarvers. He didn't even know that you guys existed. <laughs> yeah. So I gave him the magazine that you sent me up, and uh, uh, he was going through that. Um, and from what he was telling me, they, they, there's a few of them that sort of get together in a small town outside of Fort Francis. Um, but they, they, it's more of an, an informal type thing. So, so, so right now I'm more of a club of one. 
I imagine a lot of us are like that. <laughs> and in some ways, you're still an outsider. You haven't only been there two years. Uh, well, I'm getting in there pretty good. Uh, the the day after uh, uh, I got the article in the local paper, uh, uh, I was taking my dog for a walk around the corner here, and one of the neighbors came running out and says, "Hey, I, I work for a trucking firm here in town. And I saw your uh, I saw your mug in the local paper, and you do carvings. Can you can you carve me a, a custom truck to scale?" And here's some pictures. <laughs> so he gave it to his boss for a Christmas present at, a, at their, uh, their Christmas party. Very good. <laughs> and then uh, several of my neighbors, like I, I'm not even really heavily advertising myself, and just the neighbors just from chatting. Um, I think uh, three neighbors on either side of me the, um, have all got uh, wood spur bark carvings hanging on their back porch now. <laughs> <laughs> then uh just to just out of curiosity i, I made some wood spirits and uh, like a fairy house uh uh lighthouse type things you know like little 20 inch uh 18 inch carvings out of uh, uh bark and uh um, i posted it in the local uh, there's there's three local farmer market buy and sell type online things here on facebook and I figured, oh, I'll just give it a try. I haven't been on Facebook for over eight years now. And let's try something different. And uh, within minutes, uh, I started selling uh, uh, bark carvings. Uh, just uh, last week, I shipped three to one lady in Thunder Bay, three to a lady in Edmonton, or sorry, Winnipeg. And uh, I'm looking to my left here. I got about a dozen or so. Uh, ready to go <laughs> they just took off like uh oh, I was gonna say, Gord, I, I'm really curious that you mentioned this because uh one of my one of our carvers his name is Ed Goslin and it could be Mrs. Goslin that's buying all the bark carvings from you because he's been sending me pictures of a carver from Fort Francis that that carves all these beautiful wood bark carvings and I guarantee it's got to be you then right well, there's there's one other guy who does bark carvings, but he 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 does uh, he does really thick bark where he puts really detail. He puts paint, he paints them, and everything. Oh, okay, okay. I, I don't go, I don't go that far, at least not. I, that far. I, I I try to keep them simple because people don't want to buy two hundred dollar carvings uh, yeah. around here. They 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 want to spend maybe twenty bucks. Exactly, and, yeah. and that's what I do is. Uh, I found a local source for the the bark, and for uh, like twenty bucks, he gives me a whole van load at a time. Wow! <laughs> it's a secret location. No <laughs> <So> kidding. Because <laughs> I know you go to Lee Valley or uh, uh, Chipping Away, they'll charge you like forty bucks for a little box of the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, you know, so but I, I because I get it so cheap, uh, it, I make really uh, simplified. But uh, nice looking carvings. Can and, you show us? Uh, I, they sell them for twenty bucks. Can you show us? Uh, yeah. Let me just um just disconnect this off my power cord. I'll see if I can do a scan here. Yeah. It, it's it's pretty crappy lighting in here, but uh, just power up my wheelchair and I can get my dog out of the way for a run her over. <laughs> She's always near my feet somewhere. If there's wood chips nearby, she'll find it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Shih Tzu, by the way. That's what she says. Uh, here, I got them all stacked up on each other here. Oh, there we um, go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're all. Let me just move this a bit. Just, uh, just moving things around. Yeah. Okay. Like over here, I got. Uh, how well can you see those? Hold, hold it up towards the front of the camera. One of them. Just yeah, one of them. There uh, we go. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a. It's a, a fairy house bark carving, kind of like a lighthouse type thing. Right. And then I got another one just to the right here a bit. And more to the left, I got these are more like the wood spirit. 
everyone of course is like fingerprints because of the bark is completely different shape right uh a little different i had a customer they ordered it's not this is experimental there's one here it's like a mermaid i don't know if you can make it out it's not, oh yeah, no, yeah. Uh, and then one over here guy asked for a little squirrel oh and then I made made that more into like a, a little fairy house on the bottom. Right. So these are a few. Good. All righty. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what I do is uh, like I'll, I'll wrap them up in bubble wrap so the, the the shippers can treat them like a football and kick them around and they won't get damaged. Now, now when, we're, when we're talking about this. For those who just joined, we're looking at the club and uh, how well the community knows who you are or where you are. And uh, looking at the possibilities of getting outside of the uh, realm that we're in, just in that own, our own little cluster, and uh, going out to the community to let them know what we do. And some people are selling, some people are just there demonstrating. So maybe you've got some experience in that area where you are, and uh, you could share that with us. Now, going back to Alec a moment, you said that you were in, uh, is it Mexico you spend a lot of the winters at, or maybe that's one of the places? Yeah, Mexico, we've been there for the last uh, eight years. So as you're there, you're carving, and no. people are seeing what you're doing, right? I don't carve down there, no. People didn't know I was a carver. Oh. But I have a couple of friends down there. One guy had his 80th birthday, and the other guy was 84. So I carved um, a caricature of each of them. And uh, they were stunned. That, like, you really knew who it was when they got the carving. So they're very pleased. It's, to me, it's a perfect gift yeah. because they'll never get a duplicate. That's right. <laughs> Now, when you think about that gift like that, uh, I think it was, I can't remember the name now, but London area. It'll come to me in a few moments, but uh, he carves small caricatures and uh, lays it on the table of the restaurant when they're leaving, along with this tip, and it's a gift to that waitress. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nice. I thought that was a great story because uh, she was really happy, it was, or she or he were really happy because they could give it to their kids or grandkids. And yeah. we have that opportunity, you know, to, to be that kind of a force in the community, let people know about our carving. Anybody else to share? Robert, have you had any experience in the community as a club member or uh, individual carving? Just individual carving. I uh, joined the club uh, about three years ago, but uh, last year was sort of a, a fizzle. So, uh, I'm just doing it all on my own right now, but uh, I've done a, doing a couple of leprechauns and that now. I just, uh, that's why I was late come in. I delivered my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the, Kevin Reed is there. You can see him on the screen. He looks to be in a spacecraft somewhere in outer space. He's flying down the road somewhere in Pickering, Ontario, or close to there, right? Can you talk to us, Kevin? I can just for a couple of minutes. My phone just told me it's just about out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your yeah. area, Pickering and, and the Pickering Carvers, what do they do in the community to reach out past the club meetings during the week? On Not like last year, but on other times. Right. Well, also, I, I do carve with Forrest. Forrest and I carve together in the Pickering Carvers. Forrest is involved in a few more other things, but... Uh, with the Pickering Carvers in the past, we've been involved at the uh, Pickering Art Fest, uh, which, which happens in June. Uh, that's usually out behind the, the back of the, uh, the library. And there's all sorts of different people there uh, with their art. And uh, on Canada Day, when Pickering puts on a Canada Day, we usually have a booth that we set up and just, it's just display. There's not really much of a selling. We mostly are just a display club at that time. So those are, the, those are the two main areas, but we've also been involved with the uh, Magic and Wood show. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of our people, because the shows in Pickering, we've done a lot of volunteering and behind the scenes and getting that thing up and running. 
Uh, but those are the main areas we are we demonstrate outside the club. Uh, and we've also, there's a few of us as well who have gotten involved with some of OCA's larger uh, projects. Like there was the Honda project for Honda's 50th anniversary in Canada. Uh, there was a number of us carving on that. And then there was the big tree for the Maple Leaf Forever, which is in the Science Center. Uh, one of the guys that uh, is Tom Gallagher, who used to be the president of OCA, he's, uh, he's really into finding um, commissions and things for people. Uh, but we've been a club that's, we've held our own as far as numbers go. And if anything, we've had actually a, a slight increase, which, it, which is kind of neat. Uh, but one discussion that we've had as well is we meet on a Wednesday afternoon. Well, anybody who's working, because I mean, I've been retired five years now, but before then you want to get involved in the club, there's nothing in the evenings. So we don't have an answer to that, but that's one of the challenges is how do you uh, find the time and organize and find the location. That's an important thing too, because it gets so expensive. I know talking with the guys from uh, the Brooklyn club and how much they pay every week just to keep themselves in a facility. Uh, we're fortunate in Pickering, we don't have that issue, but that's a challenge as well. But I am gonna have to scoot because when my battery says I've got low, it suddenly just goes dead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was able to get in. Uh, hopefully I'll get to see uh, you guys uh, tomorrow night when uh, we take a trip to, to Lee Valley. Yeah. So I'm gonna sign out now so that uh, I can sign out without being rude and just disappearing. Mm -hmm. And Kevin is one of our, uh, along with myself and Mark uh, Sheridan, we've kind of been dreaming about this a virtual show and he's been a huge part behind the scenes and making this happen so thank you kevin for what you've done marie oh, can i just uh go ahead, I give you a, a little bit of information so um listening to all of this i'm actually i think quite proud of our thunder bay group because we are very community involved um we take part in two fall fairs here rural fairs uh each summer one in september one in august uh, for many years, we carved um, small little items uh, at Halloween for the Regional Food yeah. Distribution Association. And so we would carve at a grocery store, like at the doors of the grocery store, and we would sell these little, um, little caricature pumpkin pins uh, for a donation. And then all the proceeds would go to the uh, food distribution bank. Uh, we uh, would set up, we had occasionally set up at one of, one of our largest shopping malls. And um, we do the comfort birds. We do a lot of the comfort birds. In fact, we just did a group of 12 to a, uh, a young woman that asked, uh, she works in the geriatric unit at our local hospital. And so she asked for some and she saw the post on our Facebook page and we gave her 12 and she sent three to Saskatoon and gave them to her sister-in-law to distribute there to a, to a senior's home. So we, you know, we do a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm really kind of impressed that we are actually, we do try and reach out. Now, obviously because of COVID, we haven't been able to do any of this now for over a year. So that's, you know, kind of a shame, but uh, we really do try and get out as, as much as we can. And, uh, and it, you're right, as soon as somebody sees you sitting and doing carving, they'll come up and talk to you and ask questions. And that's the way to get new members. And uh, what we're finding is it's hard to get young members um, you know, you'd like to really encourage the young people and get them on board. And we did have a young, a young, uh, a young boy that joined us um, last year before COVID hit. He and his mom came out and he was getting really uh, into it. And then, of course, this all happened. So I don't know if he's carving anymore or not. But uh, yeah, and then every year we have an annual, uh, it's called the Lakehead Exhibition. And so we have two of our carvers that sit there for five days and, uh, and demo. So yeah, we, we, we're trying to get out there as much as you can. And I think you're right. That's the way to you know, get people uh, familiar with your group. Now, Pat, isn't it Thunder Bay or is it North Bay that is doing the merry-go-round? It's Thunder Bay. You're the, we're the ones that have the article in your, in your most right. recent uh, um, uh, publication. So yeah, that's another thing that we're really proud of is that we've become involved with the restoration of a of a uh, carousel project here. And uh, we've spent hours and hours, our carvers on, on restoring all the components of this, of this carousel. 
and was supposed to have gotten organized and assembled last summer for Thunder Bay's 150th or 50th anniversary. And, uh, you know, that didn't happen. So we're kind of waiting now. Everything's shut down. Nobody can work on anything. Electricians can't put the components in for the lighting and so on. So we're really at a standstill, unfortunately. But, yeah, that's, um, that's, that was a big project for us. How old is that carousel again? Oh, you let me stop now. Oh, it's over 100 years old. Like it goes back early 1900s, I would think. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. It is a powerful statement to the community when you do this kind of thing, you get involved mm -hmm. in a bigger project. Yeah, so anybody that's watching, if you've got the magazine, check out the article um, on what we've been doing. Yeah, it's yeah. in our uh, Oka magazine, so if you take a look at it, you'll see one of the carvers right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. And as I share that with you, getting into the community is a huge part of what we want to do. But the intention is good, but sometimes it's just too much work. But just sitting there and being involved, like you said, to like in front of that grocery store, uh, making something that's simple, that could be given away for a donation, yeah. working along with a food bank, for instance, so that's a tremendous opportunity. So as we look for different places like them for us to be involved, I'd love to hear stories about this. This is what articles are about. Uh, articles in this Ontario Woodcarver Association magazine uh, have been in the past of just printing nice photos of all the winners from the big shows. But the winners to me are the ordinary guys that still carve kind of square things, have fun talking, drinking coffee together. And they're the woodcarvers of Ontario. And, you know, we're, our numbers are probably, we mail about Oh, a hundred and uh, I can't remember now, maybe almost 200 magazines are mailed out to individual members, but that also the magazines going out, go to a club. So the Ottawa group, which is about 160 members, get one magazine. And the conversion rate is starting to take place where they see the article about somebody in that club or something's happening Fellows have then bought their own memberships on top of what the club would have. And it's a lot to do with insurance. So uh, something I just mentioned, if you're not already a member of the OWCA, you can be individually. And what has happening when we do go out to malls or to a show, farmer's market, or some big facility where one of the Ontario Woodcarver Association show places at, the, the membership includes uh, an insurance policy coverage at quite a good sum for individual people showing. That's why it's so important to have that kind of a uh, little bit of extra behind us. So Kevin Reed is the fellow that actually uh, helps us. You just went off the screen here a little bit ago because of the cell phone problem. But Kevin is the one, if you want to ask more questions about that, you can email him and uh, ask questions about what the insurance is like, what it's about. We don't advertise it widely. It's just something that we talk about individual members getting it and also clubs having it. So the most of the clubs that are in a facility, the facility requires you have insurance on the club and people that would might come into it. The same thing's true when you're individually doing it. When uh, Gordon and I were at the mall our, in Peterborough, our insurance covers our displays at the front and our interaction, the possibilities of somebody suing us after they pick something up and cut their finger on it. I've got a story I can tell about Gord on this part. When we go to Lang Pranet Village together, Gord and I had two tables set up and uh, they're right nearby where our tables are set up on this antique village. <clears throat> they brought the horse and the two horses and a wagon in to give people wagon rides. Well, the wagon rides were, there was a long line of people lined up to try to get on the wagon and be moms and kids. And Gordon, you can tell the rest of that story. One kid was a nightmare. Oh, you're talking about the knife incident? Yeah. I didn't think you remembered that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, why I wanted shirts. It was a 10 year old boy and his uh, younger sister uh, left the line and came over to the table uh, and the parents weren't aware of it. And uh, the little girl was starting to ask me questions about a particular little cute carving. And uh, 
as I was leaning over to, sh to reach for it, to give to her to look at more closely, her brother reached over and grabbed my little carving knife that I had just in front of me, which I figured was plenty far enough away from interaction with people. And you paused on us. He froze. Please don't leave us at that point. It was too good a story. Hey, Gord. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Start. You, you, he reached over and he got the knife and you went. Into yeah, the he pause. grabbed the knife and he sprung back in front of his sister, just missed her. And he started waving it around and chasing her around the table. <laughs> 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 took right. me some smooth talking to get him to give the knife back. <laughs> By the time Gord settled that issue and got the knife back, I looked at him. He was kind of gritting his teeth and just steaming underneath that shade tree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need a cold drink after that one. <laughs> Luckily, in my case, nothing happened and the parents were none the wiser. <laughs> But it gives a good example of what can happen where uh, you can get a million dollar lawsuit in no time. <laughs> yeah. So, Craig, yeah. tell us a little bit about your situation and uh, either in a club or in the community. Do people know that you carve? Um, yeah, I belong to the Aurora Senior Center. And what we did last year, um, we, we have a little... Um, uh, we have a little uh, newsletter that goes to every member, and uh, we advertise if anybody wanted to learn how to carve. And we got, um, I can't remember, four or five ladies uh, joined our club, and we're training them to uh, carve things, and they're just loving it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's about all we've done, though. But uh, our, our we're in the center. It doesn't cost us anything. Well, I, I lied. It costs us $35 a year to join, but... Uh, we have every we have every tool you can think of. We have band saws and grinders and chop saws and table saws. And it's just full. the 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 town of Aurora has paid for this. We have to share it with the wood uh, wood shop, but we have more members than they have all put together. So we have Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, all day Tuesdays and all day Thursdays. But uh, with COVID now, obviously we're cut down. But so, how many members would you have in Aurora? Um, I think there's, um, uh, I can't quote you, probably 15 or 16. Okay. But the pace is very small. That's the problem. The table, there's only a few tables for maybe four or five people. Well, now with COVID, uh, when we were allowed to open up, we could only have three people in there. So um, uh, I let some of the other guys go in and, and most of the ladies that wanted to learn how to carve, they took up most of the room because they're so interested in learning how to do things. One lady did soapstone, uh, like they do um, up north where the Eskimos are. And she did a beautiful job of that. So she took to it like duck to water. Um, so she, she's doing very well. But we're showing them how to sharpen knives and how to be careful. I mean, we had them, we had them bundled up with, with, with gloves and masks and <laughs> because we're terrified of them cutting themselves. But the only thing, we can't allow anybody in there that's not, not retired. So I think carvers need to get into the young people because there's a lot of young people. I talked to somebody in a club and I saw some 18-year-olds. I forget what the club was. Um, anyway, there I, I don't think we do anywhere near enough to advertise or get young people interested. I know the Pickering Club have often gone to schools and taught kids how to school correct me if i'm wrong but yeah no, that's true they've done that yeah. and i think that's a fantastic idea not everybody's gonna like it but if you can create something from your own hands people don't have that opportunity today and um i did it with my 12 year old grandson and he made a beautiful little um i don't know like a jam jar i was in one of the carving things he did it all by himself, and uh, I helped him and coached him along the way. Um, but he was so proud of that, and I think if kids can learn to do something, um, it makes them. It makes it. It makes you. 
enjoy life in the fact that you actually created something. Mm -hmm. and, and today's world, we don't create anything. We sit on the computers and play games all day long. And yes, you learn a lot of stuff, but I think we've lost some of the creativity that carving brings back to the world. Yeah, and just as you mentioned that about the youth, uh, one of the groups in Ontario that has done a great job on this is down in Niagara Falls. And uh, when they have the show, there is one big table dedicated just to the youth. And these kids man it, they show what they've carved. And for my joy, I've been there back about three years in a row. And to see how they grew taller and better at what they're carving, and they can't wait to see you. And mm -hmm. one of the things I've done is that I, I think some of you probably know I carve Harry Potter wands. I don't advertise them that way. They're just good wands. <laughs> and what happens is when you carve the wands, uh, when I first started doing that, I have them on my table. Uh, people would come to a craft show or Lang Pioneer Village, that kind of thing. And you'll see a teenager or early team, 12, 13 years old, up to 14, being dragged along because they've been camping. So they need to bring him along. They can't leave him at the campsite or her at the campsite. They can be about a hundred feet away from my table and they see a wand. Those turned off teens come alive like there was something lit inside of them. Come over and they want to talk about carving a wand. And, and how did you do that? And wow, this is Harry's wand. This is Hermione's wand. This is, they know all of them. And so I've had, I've, I started doing that because my granddaughter at about eight started reading these books, got all excited. So I carved wands. And now today she's just finishing her fourth year of university and going into the fifth year. And she's still Harry Potter freak. Wow. <laughs> she knows everything there is. Well, when some of the kids say to me, they said, well, I said, what do you like doing? And they said, well, I, I play computer games. I said, how long do you play computer games? And mom's standing beside them and she's rolling her eyeballs. And he said, well, uh, a little bit. She says, a little bit. He says, well, for a couple hours. She said a couple of hours, <laughs> like 60 you know, hours a week. <laughs> he was, the kid was playing three to four hours straight. And I said, well, you see this wand here takes you, it would take you about three hours to carve this. And then you can sell it to your friends for $45. Can you do that with a computer game? Ka-ching, ka-ching. There's something about an early teen mind that loves money. Mm -hmm. this day and age and so i do the monetary thing i go right to the heart of where they are at. and uh i have a, had a grandson i have a grandson he's now in he's electrician's apprentice I finished his college after high school finished college and then now joined up in a better in the full trade and uh one time he's in grade 10 with me he carved three elder wands in one morning i had the blanks cut out for him and he just sat there never moved, never stopped, kept going. And he had those wands down to look exactly like mine. Hit the finish on it. Next week, he sold it to his friends for 45 bucks a piece of school. Not only is he a carver, but he's also a salesman. <laughs> you know, it, it just does my heart good as a grandpa to see that kind of ignition. And the, these kids down in Niagara Falls, one thing about the Niagara Falls show is that they have uh, what they ask everybody in the, that comes into the show or the guests that come in from the community to vote on which table is the best table display. Well, that year when the young people saw me and they were there, that youth uh, table, I got the award. And they come over and told me after, they said, well, we're so glad you got the award. We saw the wands and we all voted. <laughs> So there's a little plus in having just the right stuff on the table, too. Well, it, you know, as we look at the encouraging those kids that are coming up, how would we do it? Well, number one, you have to do it when they're free. They're in school. Right after school is probably not the best. I'm doing art classes now with uh, 10, eight, eight, nine, 10 year olds. And they start off, they're all excited to draw the picture. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of drawing, they go, oh. they've already been in school since about 8.30 in the morning till 3.30. And now I expect them to learn something new. 
Well, coming along on school breaks and different times where you could set classes up, uh, Gordon and I both have done soaps, or not, uh, like soap carving, not soap, soap, soap carving with kids during school breaks with the younger ones and give them a white plastic picnic knife and a place to, to carve at and show them how they can carve a dog or something out of that bar of soap. We use the sunlight soap that comes from home, uh, home hardware. It's kind of a sticky, big block, yellowish colored uh, laundry soap. Uh, that particular soap is tremendous because the kids finish carving, they have clean hands like you cannot believe. And also we have a super mess on the floor. <laughs> so those are just some of the ideas. Well, others maybe want to contribute something more to that. Uh, how about Ron on my screen? You're down at the very bottom of it. Uh, what about your community and your outreach is carving? You turn your mic on there. Yes, okay. we have, I'm a member of the Highlands Woodcarvers in Halliburton, Ontario. And uh, we have about uh, 25 members. We meet on Mondays, Monday afternoon from uh, one till three. So it's not a very long time for carving, but uh, we do get together and uh, have some good times. It's uh, we're, we're running into the same problem that most other clubs are. I think we're losing members and, and not being able to get new members. Um, we do have some caricatures. Here's one here that I did. If you can see it. Oh, that's super. I have another one here of a fish captain. Okay. So they're, they're uh, we get into a lot of different things. And one of our members is a, is a master carver and he has been uh, conducting sort of classes um, in carving an American kestrel. So there's about 10 of us that are carving the American kestrel and he's tutoring us along the way. So it, we have a good time and, and uh, the club's in good stead, although we haven't met for almost a year now because of COVID. Now with uh, your, you're saying Highland uh, is the word to use to describe the club. What community in that area do you meet in? Halliburton. In where? Halliburton, Ontario. Oh, Halliburton, okay. Yes. It's, it's known here as the Halliburton Highlands. Okay. And therefore, a, a chap by the name of uh, Gerald Hicks started the club in, um, I think it was around uh, 1967, something like that, started the club and it was called the Highlands Woodcarvers. Move your camera up just a bit so you can see your face. Why, so, do you wanna, why do you want to see that? <laughs> it's being recorded. <laughs> when I think of the time, as you say, 67, it was during that time that uh, some of the formation of the Ontario Woodcarver Association was just beginning. It would be into about the 19, mid-70s when they started to really form into something bigger, uh, connecting with everybody. Were your car carvers involved in the CNE shows at all? Um, a number of uh, the I, I don't know whether they were involved in the CNE shows. There has a couple of carvers. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Picard is one that comes to mind who has been down to uh, Maryland and um, Atlantic City where the, the big shows are. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Bob Hall is our sort of librarian and he looks after our, our memberships and uh, continuing the membership with the Ontario Woodcarvers. But I don't know whether they originally, uh, Gerald Hicks was strictly into ducks. If you didn't do ducks, go and find another club, kind of an <laughs> attitude. Um, but then it expanded and uh, we do all kinds of things. One of our members, uh, Keith Rydberg, has been carving for over 35 years. He does a lot of small caricatures. He, uh, he made a chess set. Absolutely amazing piece of work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have a full, full stream of uh, members 
And from time to time, we, we range from about 10% to 20% women, as opposed to men. Uh, just about everyone is retired, I think. So uh, yeah, we've got a good club going. See, one of the things that you mentioned, uh, the fellow that does the ducks or somebody that does the caricatures, it's great to see you all in the same club. And over at uh, Kitchener Waterloo, when I was at the uh, big show that we were take, we took part in the Owl's Nest part of the uh, it, nationals, uh, uh, National uh, Wildfowl Competition. And the uh, Owl's Nest was just kind of over to the side of their group, the, the meeting. And a young fellow came by. Uh, he was probably mid 30s to late 30s. He had a wife and kids. He was there and he walked up to my table. I had one of the wooden chains laying on the table and he said, oh, wow. He said, a wooden chain? My grandpa used to carve these. I said, do you carve wooden chains? No, he said, I, I wanted to carve a wooden chain. And so I went and joined the, the wood carving group that was available that that time. And I walked in and sat down and I, I said, I'd like to carve a chain. And the person looked at him and said, here, is a blank for a cardinal and you're going to carve a cardinal. He yeah. said, I didn't want to carve a cardinal. Yeah. <laughs> he wanted just to carve a chain. Well, the, he got into a group that's all bird carvers. Now, mind you, he did win uh, for, he won a couple of ribbons for the fox he carved and also for one of the birds he carved. So he's kept on going, but uh, he's going to give a chart carving the chain uh, a possibility too. So I think that as, you, as we share that, and some of these folks that are coming in, younger folks that are coming in, they see carvings, they've see, heard about carving, and they've got maybe a heritage of carving. We need to be sensitive to that fact and let yeah. people carve what they want to carve. And, and that our club is, is totally open. Um, one of our members had organized probably four years ago a totem pole carving exercise and he he's a good friend of of a totem pole carving instructor and uh, they've had probably two courses a year for the last four years in totem poles and and um, masks from the west coast so we're totally open and it you carve whatever you want to carve no, no restrictions yeah so my dream is that it's on my bucket list to get up to Halliburton to come to your club meeting. Absolutely. We're more than welcome. I've got quite a few communities around, but that's one that was in 2020, but it just didn't happen. Well, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> well, any last comments from any of you want to give a contribution? Karen, probably you're the one that's been in and out of here a little bit, and uh, you need to share something from your club and from your experience? Well, Alex is uh, in our club. Okay. In the Guelph club. Hi, Alex. How are you doing, Karen? <laughs> Good. Um, we haven't met for a year and it's, it's we send out uh, the president, Ken, he sends out uh, emails, but barely, nobody responds and we just don't know how to get them involved, but this has been absolutely great. And I, I wish more than Alex and I were here. <laughs> uh, just as a, a thought along this line, uh, when we're thinking up this uh, and planning towards this virtual show, uh, a question came up was, what do we do in it? And I said, well, there's one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offer uh, an opportunity for people to carve something or offer their pictures just carved that they've carved for a two inch by two inch by four inch. Now, what happens if nobody contributes and nobody responds, just like you said, Karen? Well, I've been overwhelmed by the number of people that said, uh, you know, that sent their carving pictures in. And I am now getting a pretty good section of the magazine ready because I have these new pictures of carvings. Right. That are right. really different. And one of them, or maybe more, I'm getting under conviction now, but I may be giving away more than one miniature carving because of the fact that I had such a great response. Right. Well, that's so good. We, when you look at the community like that, maybe an advertising newspaper said, uh, 
carving challenge. If you'd like to carve, come along with us. If you're already carving your own, this is going to happen on a certain day, and there will be a prize for you if you come and join us. It works yeah. with teenagers, and it works with older people that are just teenagers with older bodies. <laughs> people love the word free. Free is good. <laughs> now, Alec, I want to finish off by you doing a show and tell here, simply to take your camera, as you did the other evening, take it off of your face, oh. and go up to your shelf. Okay. This guy's got an amazing place he sits in. And for a fellow that takes about uh, so many months a year away from carving, he is a prolific carving, a carver in his own world. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is the older stuff and it gets newer as we go along. Uh, there's Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, Waylon Jennings. And this is my... Uh, my horse's ass. The family has a uh, a rib <laughs> contest, annual uh, rib off, it's called. And this is the loser. So my name is on 2019. First time ever, but uh, you got to get it sometime. <laughs> and then these are just that's some of the newer ones. And uh, the ones that I I design myself pretty much are in the living room or the rec room rather. A lot of these are, uh, this is Eldon Foote's, uh, not Eldon Foote, Eldon Humphreys. This is a course from him. This is a course from Eldon, a course from Eldon. I do a lot of ball players. There's a ball player he's not done yet. Am I moving too fast? Yeah, just go down to the second shelf now, go slower. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah, you see it good. A little lower. Are these the newer ones? No, these are the older ones. The newer ones are in the other room. Okay. Did you want to see some of them? Well, if, how hard is that to do? Not hard at all. Okay. <laughs> we'll follow you. Okay, come with me. <laughs> Walk this way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a lumberjack. Can you see that okay? Yep, really good. And then uh, the newer style lumberjack. Ah. And a lot of these I get off Pinterest. <laughs> see those okay? Yep, really yeah. good. Okay, now this... Uh, See the, the old man and the young man? Mm. I was doing Lord. the old man and somebody said, uh, well, what's the difference between that and a young man? So I did a young man so they could see the same thing, but different. Go, go a little bit lower in the camera so we can see it. There. Super. Okay, and this is another one of Eldon Foots. He has that in his, uh, in a book in the, Character Eldon Carvers Humphrey. of America. Eldon Humphrey? Yes. Yeah, Eldon Humphrey. I keep saying Eldon Foot, but it's not Foot. Who's that? <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's all I got here. The rest of my carvings I, I give away. Uh, I got them from East Coast to the West Coast, down in Mexico, in the States. And uh, the, there was even some in Thunder Bay. Anyways, that's what I do. Well, thank you for that tour. No problem. <laughs> Murray, can I just ask a question? Sure. Yes. Is there any way that a person can get a listing of the all the different groups, all the different carving clubs that are in Ontario and, and contacts? Because it would be really nice to interact with each other. Like, I really enjoyed this. And the fact that Gord's in Fort Francis, I mean, next time I'm driving by, I'm going to stop in and see him. You know what I mean? Like, we don't know where we're, you know, where people are. And if you're ever in an area where you could drop in in a meeting, it would be great to know that. So is there such a, uh, a database? Yes. If you go onto our website, there's a list of all of the places that carvers meet. Okay. It doesn't give you an exact name because sometimes the presidents change and 
the contact person changes, but it gives you the community center's name or the place that they're in and the possibility you simply would call that area. There's another place on there that has a list of the carvers and uh, who they are. So it's on the website. And okay. if you need a specific, like what this morning and over the last couple of days, we've been in touch with the New Brunswick uh, Wood Carving Association, as well as the Alberta one and some in BC. And we're dreaming bigger that maybe someday we'll be able to have a larger umbrella kind of organization to make sure we all know where everybody is. It would be just a dream right now, but it's one of the things I'd like to have. But if you need somebody's name specifically or a contact in a village or town, this person from New Brunswick has just written to us and I referred him over to Mark Sheridan, who lives in Kingston. This person in New Brunswick comes up to see a brother-in-law and family in the Kingston area and during a certain time. So it would be great to be able to connect people like that. And then New Brunswick shows coming up at the in the end of September, 1st, October, I think. And it's down in a great big, gorgeous place. Uh, they do the they, they do an actual showing. Uh, I'm not sure how it uh, describe what happens, but they have um, the carvings are presented. They're judged, and the ones that win will be sold. And I think that the guarantee, uh, the total amount guaranteed for sales, is about fourteen thousand dollars now this time around. So a majority of the carvings that come in that will win will actually be going to someplace, and the carver will receive a pretty good reward for his duty, for his work. So uh, what we're seeing, not only the contact in different places, uh, in different people, in the camaraderie that we need to share, but also the ideas that each are sharing. So in our show this time, when you look at the Ontario Woodcarver Association webpage, the virtual showing of all the carvings that were sent in have come from BC, Alberta, majority in Ontario, I think some may be from Maritimes, and uh, it is just amazing what how people responded. So there's also, if you haven't done it already, go on there and you can choose uh, a people's choice and put, there's a form on there that Mark has put on, you fill the people's choice award out on the webpage, and you can vote for one of the carvings. So this next, uh, next Saturday, a week, a week from yesterday, we'll be having the finalized, uh, final part of our Ontario virtual show and uh, the winners will be announced at that time and winners will be receiving a special something from our uh, executive to them. So uh, a certificate and so on and different things will be coming with an award ribbon on that type thing for you, uh, virtually, mind you. <laughs> All right. Yes. Hey. Um, I, I haven't heard any mention of the um, Ontario Wood Carvers. Hey, we got you, Ron. Hey, would you like another prize for your uh, two by two by four? I've got this Dell computer that keeps shutting down randomly and I'm quite willing to give it away. So your thought was, uh, what, what is it you were saying? One more thing. Um, I haven't heard any mention of the Ontario Woodcarvers clubs, uh, listing of clubs in Ontario with a picture gallery. Um, a number of years ago when Emma was the president, uh, she introduced us to their uh, photo gallery of Ontario clubs. And you can go on their club site and uh, enter any number of pictures of club members carvings. And I haven't seen that. I think Is that the change uh, has been taking place and Mark, uh, Sheridan is our webmaster and I had mentioned before to Pat uh, maybe when you were off that we have a section on there that lists where the clubs are and who some of the people are but there's not a place for people to submit their photographs right now uh, of their carvings that I know of I think that there's some things that are happening that way but one of the issues we face is the quality and the size of the carvings our magazine has to have, uh, we try to put the magazine up on, but they, we've got a, a, a pile of magazines that have not gone up yet on the website. As far as historical parts are concerned, you'll see when you go in there to look at the uh, magazines that are, are mounted, 
uh, they're, they're not all there. And one of the problems we face is that you, we have to reduce the size of the magazine itself down to be small enough that it can be uh, put on the website. Uh, our magazine actually when it's sent to the printer is somewhere between 30 to 50 megabytes. So it's a pretty good size. But when we put it up on the website, we need it to be 25 to 55 KB, kilobytes, not megabytes. So we're having to work at that right now. So should any of you happen to be computer geeks, you can come along and help the rest of us geeks do this. I'm running out of life and out of time. And I carve, but I also do the webs, uh, do the things in the president's position as well as on the editing. And uh, it takes a fair chunk of time. Each magazine takes about two solid weeks of work in order to get it done. Uh, each page will take between four to six hours per page of manipulating the photograph and also getting the text together, getting it to the person that and does our text reading and corrections. And so these are all parts of the little bits and pieces from behind the scene. I hope that helps you to understand it. So it, uh, it's maybe a longer answer. I knocked Ron right off the site to Dell Computer went dead. Well, folks, we've been on here a long time chatting. Any final remarks before we close up? Forrest, you're one of our. Well, I think you were looking to see. Members. I think you were looking to see some of what I've been doing. I've brought some over. Yeah, a little higher. Wow. That's a deep relief. Yeah, I've been working on it for a little while. It's of an ancestor. Is that what I'm puzzling about is what to fill in the background here. I'm yeah. looking for some sort of pattern just to give the carving a little bit more focus. Well, from the view I have from my computer screen, it looks a lot like you. Well, he's an ancestor. Uh, he was born in about 1820. And I used a metal tin type uh, for his image. Okay. So he's pretty old. He's pretty grumpy. I don't think he had any teeth at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's a good way to end this today. Yeah, that's for sure. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. Any further comments? Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great week, folks. You too. We'll see you tomorrow night at Lee Valley in Scarborough. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks a lot, Murray. Get your pocketbook out because it will cost you. <laughs> Thanks, Murray. I really enjoyed this. It was a good time. Okay, great. Okay. Have a great one. Yeah. Great week.